of them uh, so that we say let's have 15 to 17 minutes for the actual presentation and uh, some minutes for questions then. The first uh, uh, contribution is on estimating the error between analytical and numerical finite different solutions of Laplace equation. Uh, the authors are Alcioni, Cesar, Pereira Silva, and Leonardo Meneses, and the paper will be presented by Alcioni, uh, who has several degrees in mathematics. Actually, he is a mathematician, uh, but contributing to engineering here. Uh, and it's interesting to see that he has uh, 24 years of experience in electrical engineering, especially in the electronics and telecommunications area. And uh, so we're looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Hi. Hi, uh, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here now, now and can participate of this event, to me a big event. So, uh, I'm not an engineer, I'm a mathematics teacher, but I ever like engineering, always. And now uh, I will show to you a simple presentation of our work. Okay, <clears throat> our title is this one. Estimating the error between analytical and numerical finite difference solutions of Laplace equation. What is interesting in this work? This work presents an estimation method for the calculation of the error between analytical and numerical solution of the Laplace equation. What's the objective? expose a new method to estimate the error in problems involving the Laplace equation. Okay. So what's the problem? We have many ways to calculate some approximation to some function or variable, but the difficulty is to establish the precision, the accuracy about some calculated value. After you calculate something, how to know if your result is a good result? So, you can <coughs> solve your problem using numerical approximation, but have some inconvenience, like the cost of time processing. Depending on the accuracy or precision you want to, to achieve. What are the traditional solutions to solve some problem? In engineering, we use so much numerical approximation results, discrete sample solutions, interpolation methods, as you want, as you prefer, projection method, and so on. So, what's new in this work? In this work, it's possible to compare results using different mesh resolution and to estimate the numerical error even when you don't know the exact analytical solution of the problem. We are not calculating the exact solution. We are estimating the error involved in the problem. The comparison between simple discrete solution and the numerical approximation using an error polynomial shows how much the calculated value is closer to the exact one to the solution of the analytical problem. The procedure provides an idea about the error size. You can know if your answer is good or not. So how do we do this? First, the Laplace equation in two dimensions are here. On the left side, we have the continuous domain. <coughs> the Laplace equation is the Second derivative of phi related to x plus second derivative of phi related to y, uh, x, y, equal to zero. In the discrete domain, with the adaptions, we have the equivalent formulation. 
with the same sense. So, what are the general solutions for an n by n domain where you divide your problem, your domain? To the continuous domain, the solution approximated is this one. Phi of nm is the sum of these terms. Uh, it's important to check the coefficient. In the discrete domain, we have similar formulation with another coefficient, bn. So, how? Starting from this, we can find some important information. In any case, the general error between the discrete Laplace equation and the discrete solution in a bounded domain is this one, the difference. Oop, sorry. This difference. Here we have a difference between the sampled solution and a numerical approximation. Use the previous results. Easy. <coughs> we can follow the the following re, uh, reasoning. <laughs> the exact form of the error is dependent on the problem. However, for it mode, if delta x equal to delta y equal to delta, the expression can be determined by Taylor expansion, considering the spatial discretization delta. So, we have this approximation by Taylor. F of nm is f of nm in delta equal to zero plus the sum. This is the polynomial error generator. <coughs> and we can simplify to this. Therefore, for each mesh point, the error can be truncated at order L. However, the error estimative needs the value of AK, the coefficient. This means that more simulations with different discretizations are necessary. For instance, with three simulations, S1, S2, and S3, with N2N N and 3N discretizations, A1 and A2 are calculated using these expressions. S1, S2, and S3 are the simulations. A1 and A2 are the coefficients. After the treatment, you get the values. N is the number of parts where the domain is divided. So, the complete theory is a little more complicated to demonstrate in 10 or 20 minutes, but uh, if you have some interest in the article, complete expanded article, we have more information. But now let's check some results to verify if the process is good enough. In the first example, we have the error involved in a problem with the potential box. Let's check, for example, uh, for the mesh located in this position, 1, 1. The exact error calculation is 0 0.003457. Observe that using some mesh in quiz 5, 10, and 20 uh, discretizations, we have this value as a result of the error. But if you increase the number of simulations and you divide a fine mesh, you get another result. Comparing this result with this one, we can see that it's almost the same. We have concordance at least until the five of six uh, decimal place. It seems a good result. In the second example, we have a problem 
of the impulse. Uh, remember that for the, this problem, normally we don't have a closed answer, a closed solution. So we need to, to make some approximation. In the first column, we have a mesh divided in 255 by 255 grid. Using this quantity of simulation, we obtain this result is very different from this. But if you increase the discretization and the number of simulations, the result is so close to this one. Okay? <coughs> Verify that this problem doesn't have exact solution. In the third example, we have a problem uh, where we studied a closed strip line with many different meshes. But also the results are very concordant. Uh, comparing the fine mesh and the quantity of simulations, we have results here very similar to this one here. So it indicates that the the process is good. The method uh, can help us to verify if our calculation is good enough or if we need to do something more to, to reach another better result. And the last problem, and square coaxial problem, and the situation is the same. You have a fine mesh, very fine mesh, 281 by 281, and with five simulations, we have this, this result, very similar to this one. Our conclusions are more or less. This is a new method to error estimation for finite difference solutions of Laplace equation. We use old knowledge, but the process is new. The technique is general and may be used in different problems, even in situations where the numerical solution of the Laplace equation was not second order accurate. The work was validated by comparison between discrete solutions and numerical results. In the future, uh, we hope to study focused on establishing similar procedures to the finite difference time domain method, because we didn't didn't this didn't do this yet, okay. We have used this reference to make this work. Uh, if anyone wants, you can find. Thank you for your attention. Next one, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. We can use this one. Uh, what, what I was wondering here, um, on the right-hand side, we have one exponential function with an imaginary unit, and on the left-hand side, we have none. Uh, or are the alpha and betas possibly complex numbers? Or how how does that work out? Okay, and and that k on the right hand side is that the wave number or what is it? 
the variable k, k which does not show up in the um, in the sum. Uh, well you have n and m, and then we have the k. Yeah. Is k the wave number, or what is it? Thank you. Before the yeah. k is a constant, we we call the odd k to the formulation. Okay. Because we don't take all the points; we take the uh, special points, specific points where the k count of is k1, 3, 5, 7, just odd numbers. Okay. This is very important to get something. Okay, good. I will have to read that. Are there any other questions for? Uh, One second. No, it doesn't seem. Then let's uh, thank the author again for his presentation. <laughs> and... Uh, we can move on to the second contribution in that session, which is uh, a uh, root uh, CMA algorithm for multi-user separation. And uh, the authors are Stanislav Gorlov, uh, João Paulo uh, Carvalho Lustosa da Costa, and Martin Hart. And uh, Stanislav Gorlov got his uh, degree, uh, bachelor's degree uh, from the uh, uh, Nuremberg Institute of Technology in Germany and uh, uh, from Ilmenau he got his uh, master degree and the PhD degree in computer science from the University of Bordeaux uh, and uh, he had several other positions after that I won't mention all of them but uh, now he is with Dolby uh, and uh, doing research uh, there uh, and uh, but now we are looking for the uh, root constant modulus algorithm for multi-user separation. So the floor is yours, Stanislav. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, you have Thank already you. Yeah. I'll use this one. Um, so um, this is actually, this work that I'm going to present today, it started as a um, student project when I did my master's uh, degree at the University of uh, Ilmenau. And I did this project with Grau Powell. And um, so it took a while, a little bit, to solve some of the details that uh, I couldn't solve back then, and this is kind of more or less the results. And we decided to submit it to this conference, and it was accepted. So, um, do, do we have a, a uh, yeah. yeah, that was kind of the remark that I just made. So this is the outline. I will talk a little bit about the motivation of this whole algorithm. I will present some reference algorithm that this algorithm is based upon, which is the constant modulus adaptive algorithm. And then I will uh, present our extension to this, which is the root constant modulus adaptive algorithm, and just show some numerical results of this. OK. Um, so there is a family of constant modulus algorithms. There can be very different algorithms. They can be called constant modulus algorithms. And some of them are like candidate solutions uh, for future wireless communication systems, MIMO radar. So this kind of algorithms are used in the systems. And the ARIS applications are uh, mentioned there. So some low complexity adaptive beamforming, estimation of carrier frequency offset, or waveform design. So you can find more in the uh, literature. Um, and what so all these algorithms, um, why they called constant modulus algorithms, is because they rely that a modulated signal is a constant modulus modulated signal. So the signal, uh, such a signal, has a constant amplitude, so no amplitude modulation. And usually in, in analog modulation, it's a frequency modulated or phase modulated signal. In digital domain, it's some frequency shift keying or phase shift keying. For QAM, which is amplitude modulation, just a special case of this. Um, all right. So what we want to do, so the original CMA that we use here was uh, created and designed to counter frequency selective um, multipath. So single channel frequency selective multipath and there it was shown it can use like as an equalizer of multipath to uh, restore the constant modulus of a transmitted signal which has been distorted by the multipath. And there has been some literature before where people just made a um, CMA array out of this algorithm to apply it in a um, beamforming scenario, more or less. And there's also li literature that tries to analyze the behavior analytically and the convergence behavior of the CMA array. But every, all, most of this uh, literature, it, it kind of implies some sort of capture effect. They assume that the, the, the well, the algorithm will uh, lock onto the strongest mode, 
in a spatial spatial uh, scenario. But if you just take the basic algorithm and just make a sim array out of this, um, so this would be kind of the um, the beam pattern of the uh, sending antenna, let's say. So you have three modes here with different different power levels, amplitudes, and this would be kind of the beam pattern of the array weights that you uh, get there. So what you can see is that basically what it does, it still acts as an equalizer for for uh, for uh, for, uh, for this multi-source uh, spatial scenario, and it's not really locking into one single mode. It's just not trying to to get the signal from this direction, this direction, or this direction. But this is actually what we want to do. So, um, all right. So uh, a little bit of background. So this is the original algorithm. The uh, signal model is very uh, theoretical. No <laughs> physics in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's very classical, so you have the received signal, you have the array response matrix, this is the signals, the um, modulated signal uh, symbol data matrix, as it's called here, transmitted here, Hermitian transpose, because we assume uh, complex signals, and you have uh, some additive white Gaussian noise. Um, in here and in the following, we consider a uniform linear array in the considerations. And so what we want to do is, um, or we want to achieve is that when we receive X, we try to factorize X as, or to find these factors A and S under the constant modulus constraint. So if we assume that S has constant modulus, we try to find A and S that kind of approximates our observation X. Um, again, this is this uh, single channel transversal CMA filter, and this is the cost function as it is defined here. So it's an adaptive filtering algorithm. The cost function is actually like tries to minimize in the end the deviation from of the output from one, which would be the constant modulus, and it's squared to make it a um, convex problem. So you can have a unique solution to this, and so you use a recurrence relation, very standard. You can use uh, a stochast stochastic gradient uh, descent to update this update rules, and you can use an approximation, just giving out the expectation operator here. Um, here's the cost function again. So you can see it's uh, only sensitive to the uh, amplitude deviation, not to the phase deviation, and all these uh, solutions on these circles would be uh, solutions uh, to this problem, which means irrespons like ir uh, irrespective of the phase. And to get, get from here to the spatial array, kind of we just exchange the n, which is the time index, by the channel index of, of a uh, channel array, and then we get the CMA array. Okay, so what is our extension to this? So again, if we observe that, this is what we get from the, if we just implement the CMA array, if we mirror this thing, so turn it upside down, if we rescale, so this dimension, if we rescale it, so it kind of uh, uh, corresponds or resembles the, uh, the, the, the array response that you sent. So it's, and based on this uh, observation, we actually then said, okay, if we kind of knew this, can we just estimate the directions of arrival um, of this beam pattern? And if we, if we can estimate the direction of arrivals, then we can reconstruct the array response matrix and then we can uh, filter out um, the de desired signals. And um, so the rest is kind of the, uh, what follows is concerned with finding sort of an analytical expression for uh, this array response uh, using the discrete space Fourier transfer because of the resemblance of the Vandermont uh, array response matrix to a Fourier transform. And then we want, once we can describe this polynomial and we know kind of would want to find some uh, constraint uh, for wh what where this, these modes are and then we kind of basically try to solve a polynomial equation by finding the roots. But you will see in the following. Um, so the discrete space for your transform is, um, it's actually in the EULA case as we described you can you can use the conjugate beam response of the EULA and you can describe it as a Fourier spectrum uh, in this way. It's periodic with 2p and in this case mu is just the spatial frequency uh, for the spatial case 
And two important uh, transform uh, pairs, which you will also find in the literature or on, on the Fourier transform that you can find is that, is the kind of the sampling because of, um, we have here a uh, discrete signal here. And also that the rectangular function corresponds more or less to this exp expression, which is like a sync function or actually more generically uh, directly uh, kernel. And these are the two correspondences that you we will use in the following to derive the results. And you also need, well, training. <laughs> um, these two um, transform properties that this is the modulation thingy that if you modulate signal in, in, the, in the spatial domain, in the frequency domain, you will have a, a frequency shift. In the windowing theorem that you, if you apply a rectangular window, that it is a convolution in, in the spatial frequency domain. So all standard stuff. So um, then we assume once we have the array, the array has a certain size, a certain aperture size, and it has, you can consider it as a finite la length sequ sequence of certain number of samples. Um, and if you use the windowing theorem from, uh, from before and uh, assume a rectangular window because we had an in in infinite series just to uh, um, account for the uh, limited aperture size and using the, the convolution theorem and all this together, we actually see that for the array response uh, can be described with this expression. And this is the discrete space Fourier transform here. And it's actually a Fourier series approximation of degree m minus one. Um, Okay, so why does it help us now? So um, now we take an array steering ve vector, which has the Vandermont structure and, uh, of an EULA, um, and then we compute what it actually looks like, and we want to know where, for instance, the maximum is. So if we plug it in the array steering vector, which can be described in this way, we plug it in into DS DSFT from before, after some formulations, we get the result that at the maximum level, so this is the, uh, the mode, the direction of the mode, you have a value m, which is the number of the antenna elements. But um, the next step, we want to know what is the value, the correct value, if you have, uh, uh, well, several receivers, uh, several emitters, and we want to know what is then, where is the maxima, where are the modes located? So now we have a superposition of a ray steering vector, which is just the sum of the exponentials for, uh, for, for the number of uh, antenna arrays, just plugging it in again, uh, computing the expression, and then we get this more complex term for, in the more general case, when you have uh, uh, D sources. And here it's just an example for two. But if you, so you have here something which is real, and this is a phase term, and this phase term is some sort of an um, intermodulation product between the relations of the two modes. But for certain, th um, if the, distance between the, the spatial frequencies follows this rule, for instance. It is purely real, so this term vanishes. And this expression is then exactly this. So this is like an analytical uh, expression then in this case. So we have a polynomial, and we know that the modes, uh, the maxima actually, the places where the modes are on the, on the y-axis must have this value. So we can set up a cr uh, an equation of a polynomial which must uh, fulfill, be equal to this value, and this is where the, how we try to find, find the direction of our arrival. What is maybe important here to say is that the angles of interest are not where the beam pattern would have the maximum. So if you just do a maximum search here, you would find the wrong angles, actually. So you have to solve it in a different way. Um, so from the beam pattern, we need to get to a Z transform. This is what we do. Z transform uh, is very simple. You just substitute Z by the, uh, by the exponential. And then you get to a polynomial notation for, uh, for, the, uh, for the sum of the array responses for the array steering vectors. And this thing you can write as a polynomial here. And if you convert it to a uh, normal form, so where the polynomial is zero, you just, um, so actually before you would just, you just set this polynomial equation so the value where you, where, where, where the maxima, are, well not the maxima are, where the angles of interest are and you try to get then to the angles of interest. And this is how you do it, so you just subtract to this, you get 
an equation that this polynomial must be zero. It has m minus one roots, just this is basic math. And what you can do, of course, um, you can solve this equation just computing the roots of this, of this polynomial. And what are, so this thing it has m minus one roots, but it has only two solutions, so how do you find the correct solutions for this equation? Um, you can just plug them in into the polynomial, just evaluate if they correspond to this value that you're looking for. Or you can just say that you know how many sources are emitted and you know that the, uh, that the solutions must lie in the unit circles. So you can just take, can take just the, uh, the roots that lie the closest to the unit circles and the frequency uh, estimates are just simple. You just take the argument of the roots. So Z, D would be the root. Okay, some numerical uh, example. So we here in this case, uh, we assume three QPSK uh, sources in far fields so that all amplitudes here are, are, are the same. And every, like a frequency reuse um, radio system, we don't assume any polarization and no intermodulation so that the distance between the frequencies corresponds to this relation that I have shown before. Um, the number of antenna elements is eight. The angles are given here. And the weight vector, as I said before, you would take the original CMA ve weight vector. You would subtract the, how you, the, init the uh, initial solution where you start to iterate from. And you would just rescale it to get some sort of this shape. Well, this is the magnitude. And so this is kind of the magnitude respo uh, response of the polynomial. This is, this is where the angles are. And if you compute the roots of the polynomial behind this representation, this is the representation you get. So you get m minus one, in this case m is eight, so seven roots, and this is where the roots are. And you see that three roots are on the unit circle. And if you then compute the angle of, so they have all magnitude one, which should be the case, and if you look at the angle, you get 20 degrees, like here, 323, well, a little bit of error here, uh, minus 53.3. So you see this is how the proce procedure basically works. Um, and I was maybe pretty quick, but that leaves uh, time for questions. So actually with this, what we have proposed, you can use the original uh, constant modulus algorithm in the scenario when you have uh, multiple users but you have to do this intermediate step where you not solve for the optimal filter weights, but you try to decompose the filter weights in terms of the directions of arrival. And then you can use these directions of arrival to reconstruct the array steering metrics and then solve the equation in a least square, uh, least square sense, for instance. So it's just a summary. So the classical summary does not lock on a single mode in, in, in the spatial filtering case, acts as a full band equalizer, there is a capture effect, but you cannot really prove it. If you just see simul simulations, there is it's just an equalization, uh, what is being done. And this is what we presented. We extended this um, approach, uh, the filter. So it's now a direction of arrival estimator. And it kind of enables the separation, at least this is like numerical examples. I mean, in a physical realistic case, it would be to evaluate it, and also it should be evaluated how sensitive is it to noise and stuff like that. But we have run some experiments already before. There is an analytical solution to this. So far, um, a high SNR ratios would get pretty much the same performance, which, uh, we, and this is very simple what we do here. Uh, for a lower SNR scenarios, the actual CMA algorithm is more sensitive to noise. And so on analytical algorithms, which is there in the literature, might provide somewhat better uh, precision. But for, um, well, this is a simpler solution in any case, it's cost less. And that's, that's it. So thank you very much for, the, for listening. Hello? Okay. So just as a curiosity, did you have the time to compare this to other uh, DOA estimation methods, uh, performance-wise, or do you have an insight to how, how do you compare this with other methods available today? 
Uh, like I said, we did compare it. It's just not part of this paper because it's been a while since I actually worked on this. And in the meantime, I found like solutions, analytical solutions for some of the problems we encountered. But then there is the called the analytical CMA algorithm, which solves the problem as an eigenvalue problem, stuff like that. So we compared to this algorithm. And like I said, for a high SNR scenarios, we get with much less effort, pretty much the same performance. For very low, for lower SNRs, this is where we become uh, worse. But like I said, it's not actually the, the, the search of the polynomials, it's just the uh, CMA itself might just provide like something coarser and not so precise. So whatever we do afterwards is just constrained by the first result of the actual CMA array. But yeah, I mean, more, more experiments should be done, I guess, to see really. But it's just, it's, it was more like a, as you would call it in German, Gedanken experiment. <laughs> So it was just a question. We just observed this interesting thing that it was it would equalize the original uh, beam response. So um, we just said, hey, can we just get from this filters actually some information back? Because it's we cannot separate the users from the from the filters. But if we can find the directions, we can uh, we can do it, and we do it in a very simple way, basically. So is this, it's more like a side effect from from applying the filter. Uh, the filter just does not lock onto one single thing. It will not filter out one single element. It just equalizes everybody, all the signals which are have a constant modulus, more or less. So, and with this extension, you can just find this. You can use whatever it gives you, which is wrong, but still get a correct solution. So this is actually the idea behind it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Please. The word with noise. Uh, yeah. Can go back. Uh, it's uh, the SNR is 20 dB in this case okay. compared to the yeah. strongest mode. Yeah. Uh, what about model order? You need to know in advance how many wavefronts, yeah. uh, how many modes are That's we writing. The thing. Um, I have also some extension to this where you can estimate also the model order in this case. You, you can do something, and in this case, also the limitation that I show here, all uh, signals are assumed to have the same power. So I have some extensions where the powers are different and you can estimate the model order and, they, and then you can constrain it differently and then you can get to the same solutions, but you do some other steps in, uh, before as a pre-processing step. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Uh, so if there are no more questions for Stanislav, thank you again. Thank you. And uh, we move on to the uh, third presentation in this session, which is on antenna array based receivers for third generation global positioning systems. Uh, and the authors are Mateos uh, da Rosa Sanata, Ricardo Kerle Miranda, João Paulo Carvalho Lustosa da Costa, Felix Antreich and Daniel uh, Vale Lima. The uh, presentation will be given by Daniele Vale de Lima, uh, who has an uh, bachelor's degree and a master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Brasilia here. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Professor. And good afternoon to all. I'm gonna present antenna rate based receivers for third generation global positioning system. We're all aware of GPS. And you're all using it in one capacity or another, only if it's for Google to track you and know where you are at all times. And we're used to this. It's ubiquitous technology nowadays. We're using it everywhere. And it's a technology that's getting upgraded. They're researching on top of it and they're making new additions. In this case, we are talking in general about GNSS, which are global navigation satellite systems. Nowadays, it's not only not GPS, but also the Russian one, the GLONASS and the uh, Galileo, which is by the European Union, still in implementation, and the Chinese Beidou. And we have several applications of which you are already aware of. It's used nowadays, like I said, ubiquitously everywhere. Down here we see uh, a scenario in which a user would be able to estimate his position on Earth. He needs to have at least four satellites in view of which he can, he'll know the satellites and he will perform a procedure called time delay estimation. He does this by correlating the code, which is known from each satellite. And through this, he will know the time that it takes for the signal to the satellite to reach the user on Earth. With the four satellites, we also receive the satellite's positions. 
and thus we can estimate the position on the planet. Now, one problem is you are basing yourself on the code correlation. And the biggest problem to this is called the multipath, which are copies of the signal that are reflected or refracted around the environment. Because you have a copy of the same signal with the same, co is correlated extremely to the same signal, and it will degrade the autocorrelation function used in time delay estimation. So it's interesting to focus on techniques which can mitigate multipath the, under these scenarios. Over here we see an illustration of a s signal coming from a satellite. A user on Earth is receiving it, but a copy of the signal has bounced off a building and is also being sent to the receiver. That is the multipath. We refer, refer to it as a loss, line of sight, and a end loss, non-line of sight signal. Nowadays, we're not only able to process with one antenna, such as your cell phone does, but it's also possible to apply array signal processing to GPS, where you can use an array of antennas to improve the capacity for processing on top of the signal. And we have current state of the art, like the high order, values, high order singular value decomposition, which creates an eigenfilter from the high order, value, high order singular value decomposition. And over here we propose what's called the canonical polyadic decomposition by generalized eigenvalue decomposition. I'm going to say CPD, GVD because that's quite a mouthful. And tensor-based approaches, they provide better results because they have more identifiability than matrix-based results. So they tend to be more precise and sometimes even has less ambiguities. There's uh, also an improved accuracy that not only are the tensor-based approach being applied, but also instead of using the legacy course acquisition code, which is CA second generation global positioning system, in this case, we are using the third generation L1C pilot and time multiplexed binary offset carrier uh, modulation that is used in third generation GPS. And it does outperform the legacy course acquisition code. And so yeah, this paper will incorporate both the tensor-based scheme and the third generation GPS. Here we see an overview of the L1C. Like the course acquisition code, it's a spe spread spe spectrum technique that not only allows for separation of the signal, but also allows time delay estimation. In this case, it uses the same frequency of 1.023 megabits per second, but the epic is 10 times as long as the legacy CA code. Along with that, it also uses an overlay code, which is known as L1CO which is a longer code, which allows synchronization between the two. So it's easier to detect if there's a bit tr transition. As you can see here, you can see in an 18 second message, you can see the L1C code here in the middle, here in the middle, and the L1C overlay code over here on top, and the L1C code here in the bottom, and they synchronize. The time multiplex binary offset carrier modulation is a variant of the binary offset character carrier modulation, the BOC, used in GPS already, in which uh, the, the center lobe, if you see the power spread, the power spectrum density, you'll see that the form is not only along the center, but also divided in frequency. And in this case, we're using BOC 1, 1. That means we're using one frequency. It looks like a Manchester code and a BOC 6 one, which is the same symbols, but at six times the rate. And in this case, they're modulated in time. So not only are, do they show up, this is the 1-1, one, one, and this is this BOC 6 one, to have 25% of the power be transferred to the pilot and 75% to the data. And here we see the combined result of the L1C pilot code, the square wave of the modulation and the pilot channel. The data model is a standard used in array signal processing in which we have, in this case, it's a signal coming from sa several satellites, which are D satellites in this case. So it's the summation of the first satellite to the Dth satellite, in which case we have the array response of each satellite, the complex amplitude matrix, which is a diagonal matrix which contains not only the amplitudes of the signal, because it's very frequent for a multipath signal to be attenuated relative to the line of sight signal, and the, co the code that is used in each satellite is the pseudo-random sequence. And of course, noise. This K here is the index which 
indicates that it's from each kf epoch. We will sample during k, k epochs total. This is the total signal from all satellites and from all signals from all satellites plus the noise. Now, the main thing here is to apply the VEC operator to X. As you can see, because the gamma is a diagonal matrix in the previous slide, in this case, it's going to be turned into a vector. And, uh, when, and this is the combination, which is a, a kachur harau product with the transpose of the code and the array responses. And as I can see here, if you look at the noiseless signal tensor, it's very similar to the first mode unfolding of a noiseless tensor. So you can fold it back into a tensor fashion, in this case, which is compatible with the Perfect model. And now the factor matrices are this complex amplitude matrix, the code matrix, and the array responses, and the noise tensor. We utilize a correlator bank to achieve separation between the signal of each satellite. In this case, we're trying to separate out satellite D, and we use a correlator bank. Of note here is that this is actually a compressed correlator bank, because if you use an uh, ordinary correlator bank, it will color the noise, and it won't be Gaussian anymore. Over here, you can see the equation for it. It's actually the left-hand singular vectors of the correlator bank using the thin SVD. And over here, as you can see, when you pass through the correlator bank, it's a spread spectrum technique that will wash away the other signals. This part here, the summation, which are all the signals that are not from the DS satellite, they tend to zero. So the signal will be approximately only the signals coming from the D satellite. Now in this case here, if there's any doubt, this is the identity tensor with the model order. It is presumed known. Here we have the state-of-the-art eigenfilter that's based on the higher-order value singular, higher-order singular value decomposition. In which case, the third mode unfolding of the tensor is used through pre-processing scheme, combining forward-backward averaging and expanded spatial smoothing. This is similar to spatial smoothing, except that instead of folding the signal back into a third-order tensor, it folds it into a fourth-order tensor to preserve information from the subarrays. And this tensor then is fed to a high order singular value decomposition. And the right hand singular vectors are used, their highest power modes actually, vectors are used to perform the end mode product, and that's used to filter the signal, which is combined with the remainder of the correlator bank, which gives us a vector. This vector will correspond to the taps of the correlator bank, and this modulus will cor uh, correspond to the correlation. By applying it by cubic spline, inter spline interpolation, then we perform time delay estimation. Now, CPD GVD, it also uses the high order singular value decomposition. And in this case, it uses a compressed core tensor. It's similar in some ways to the CFP, closed form parafac, if you've seen it. But instead of performing several different diagonalizations, it only uses the first two slices of the compressed core tensor. And with that, it will estimate the factor matrices composing the tensor. Here we see the high order value singular decomposition. It extracts the core tensor and the singular vectors from the high order SVD. And the signal space compression will utilize the model order to compress the core tensor. The first two slices are used for generalized eigenvalue decomposition. And the first mode, right-hand singular vectors, its conjugate is used to produce this product here between the first, or first mode unfolding, the transpose, the, right, the conjugate of the right-hand singular vectors, and the eigenvectors from the generalized eigenvalue decomposition. Now, this is similar if you've seen least squares kachi raw factorization that we can perform a singular value decomposition to make an estimate for the second and third factor matrix of the tensor. The kachi rao product of these two estimated factor matrices are then used and combined with the first mode unfolding to make an estimate for the first factor matrix. 
The scenario we're simulating will use the satellite number 17, PRN is pseudo-random noise, which refers to the code coming from the 17th satellite. We're using a Vandermond left central emission uniform linear array. This case has le eight elements and it's calibrated. That is, we're using half wavelength spacing. We're using two, sig two signals coming from the satellite. That means there's one line of sight signal and one non-line of sight signal. And carrier, there's a separation of 30 degrees between the line of sight and the non-line of sight signal. And we're using the carrier frequency, which is standard GPS, of 1,575.42 megahertz. Carrier to noise ratio is 48 dB hertz, so it gives you a pre-correlation SNR of minus 15 dB, approximately, and an approximate post-correlation signal-to-noise ratio of 15 dB. We also have an SMR, signal-to-multipath ratio, which is the ratio between the line of sight signal and the non-line of sight signal, which is relatively attenuated. In this case, it's 5 dB. So it finds itself at approximately 10 dB. The L1C pilot channel, its epoch is 10 milliseconds, and it has a bandwidth of 12.276 megahertz. To make the comparison fair, we're using, the CA code has an epoch time of one millisecond, so we used 10 epochs for each epoch of the L1C pilot channel. And we also use the same bandwidth to make it fair again. That's why over here, the amount of samples used is 30 epochs for third generation L1C and 300 epochs for second generation legacy CA code. And to perform expanded spatial smoothing, we're dividing the array into five subarrays with four elements each. Here we see the results where we're comparing the results of the CPDGVD here on top. This is second generation. It corresponds to the result of having pr a priori information about the channel and using those to filter out the uh, correlated code matrix and then performing time delay estimation. And over here on the bottom, we see the same results by using third generation GPS. In which case you can see that there's a small, but there is a gain between second and third generation GPS. Here we're comparing the high order eigenfilter, which is the other state of the art technique. As you can see, it, perform it makes a hump depending on the correlation between the signal. In this case, we're comparing the second generation with the third generation. The results are a little bit more drastic, so simpler techniques can be better applied to third generation GPS. And here's the comparison with the a priori filtering with the channel information. We have the conclusion that tensor-based approaches, they will perform better than matrix-based approaches, and you have results that are consistent with having prior information about the channel. It is robust against multipath, we know that from the fact that it will filter and achieve results similar to having a priori information. And second generation can be implemented in this case using the same techniques, just like you could do second generation, as has been proved in the literature. And it will have results that are uh, preferable compared to second generation. Any questions? He asked already, are there questions for the speaker? I would have at least one question. Oh. Um, you have shown that with uh, the technique you proposed with the tensor description that you get better performance. What is the price to be paid? Normally, we always have to pay something for getting an advantage. Yeah, the computational complexity is much greater. In fact, even comparing the high order singular value decomposition uh, techniques, it has about half the computational complexity compared to the other one, like the CPD, GVD. So you're gonna be paying in computational complexity at the very least. Okay. Good, but I think that is not really a disadvantage because uh, what may be a problem in complexity today will not be a problem tomorrow or in a year after from now because there's always technology progress in sure. uh, computational resources. Uh, one other question concerning the spatial smoothing. There are only two wavefronts. Why do you need so many subarrays for spatial smoothing? Because two correlated wavefronts I, uh, well, would yeah. be possible without... Uh, uh, while the objective is correlation and the scenario isn't that 
exacting, but it, in the literature, you find a similar scenario being compared time and time okay. again, so we just chose it because it's very common. Okay, good. Yeah, then, uh, if there are no other questions, let us thank the speaker again. Thank you. And uh, move on to the last, but certainly not least, presentation in this uh, session, which is on tracking intruders in Internet of Think networks by means of DNS traffic analysis, where I don't know what DNS is, but we will learn that. Uh, and that paper uh, is authored by Thales von Sperling, uh, Francisco Lopez, Rafael Timoteo, Lucas Martins, and Rodrigo Lima. And uh, the presentation will be given by uh, uh, Thales Lewis von Sperling. Uh, who is a network engineering student. Uh, he is just developing his final undergraduate project in the National Institute of Science and Technology on Cybersecurity. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I guess we're just waiting up for the presentation to come up. So again, everybody, I'm an undergraduate student here at UNB. So is another author that we have, Rodrigo, and the other authors are master's students here under the graduate program in, on electrical engineering. And we all are part of the research project focused in Internet of Things here at, hosted at UNB. So we're gonna start the, the presentation going over the motivation. Why do, did we come up with this? And the solution is quite obvious. We are talking about Internet of Things. So inside our network, we have devices collecting data, information about our physical space and maybe the logical space. And that information may be sensitive if it leaks or if anybody has access to it. So the way that we operate, we have our sensors sending our information to a cloud. Why do we do that? Because we want to make that, that data available to other devices. But whenever a device wants to send information to the cloud, it needs to resolve the address from that cloud. And because of that, it uses DNS, of course. And whenever it uses DNS, we cannot be certain whether the name is going to be resolved correctly because we, can know, we don't know the identity of the DNS server. Sorry. DNS is the protocol, uh, it stands for Domain Name System, is the protocol responsible for getting names from websites like Google and transforming into numbers, which machines understand. Thank you. So whenever a device tries to reach out to our cloud, which has a name, it's going to resolve its address to it. And in IoT, that's going to be a vulnerability because what if we consult a DNS that we don't know and our data is actually being sent out to an attacker, to someone wanting to know our environment? So that's why we came up with our proposal, which is performing a DNS analysis. Well, and we're going to track the DNS and out outgoing traffic from our network, and we're going to detect whether those DNS queries are allowed or not allowed in our our network, and we're going to use this, our user interface to generate alarms and see what, what's going on with the traffic inside our network. So the architecture that we build has three main components. We have the Internet of Things devices, which are normal things that we have in our home, like Amazon Alexa or Arduinos, whatever is taking data from our environment. It doesn't matter which data it is. And in the middle between the path that I told you about, that these devices are sending data to the middleware that we have, that's our cloud solution for IoT, we have this traffic analyzer in the middle, 
which is going to receive all the outgoing data from these devices, and it's going to redirect to our cloud. And why we do that? Because doing that, all the clients are, which are going to consult the middleware are going to send their DNS requests through our traffic analyzer. So we're going to capture whether they're consulting trustworthy DNS name servers or not. So talking a little more about our traffic analyzer. It's a, it's a physical device. I have it here with me, how we implement it. It's a physical device, and it's a, it has a sniffing software inside of it because we want to capture every DNS traffic that is going through us. We want to capture it to perform our analysis. And we search through the DNS data flow for anomalies inside these packets. And once, once we cap capture any anomalies, we're going to perform our analysis. So our, our device here is kind of operating as a gateway for the network. Everybody inside our network is going to access it to get access to the internet. And we also implemented an alarming system, which is an application that's going to show the saved, cap the saved capture packets that we have. Um, and so do, by doing that, we're going to keep track of all the IP addresses inside our local, local network. So we're going to know who is consulting what. And we're going to know the destination address. Which, which DNS server they are consulting to. And based on that, we can decide if the, the, data, the data the devices are sending are, are getting redirected to a place that we don't know. So as proof of our concept, we built a, a, a experimental environment with using four IoT devices. These devices here, we we used a few DNS servers. These are Google's DNS. But in our case, we're considering these the DNSs are as not known DNSs because they are not registered inside our traffic anal analyzer device. So we have these four devices. And these two first devices, they're going to simulate uh, devices that are consulting DNS servers that we don't know, some DNS servers that we don't have control of. So they are considered the anomalies inside our network, while these two are going to be using the a name server that we, we know. And by doing that, we hope to capture all the DNS traffic from these two devices so we can analyze afterwards. And that's exactly what we got in our alarming system. We kicked we successfully captured all the data flow from the devices that are consulting databases that we don't know, that we don't control, that we don't have knowledge of. And by doing that, we can keep track of the, the, the source IP address so we know what device is consulting that DNS server in our network, and we know the address from, for that resource in the internet that we don't know. And also, we keep track of the timestamp know when, when these DNS queries happen. So here we only, okay, so going back, we have four devices, but here we only see two IP addresses going out of our network. That's because our alarming system uh, interface only shows the DNS traffic capture from the devices that we don't trust, the devices that are consulting unknown name servers. That's why it doesn't show here, the devices that are consulting places that we know. A little more about the traffic analyzer. It was built on top of a Raspberry Pi with two Wi-Fi interfaces, one Wi-Fi interface acting as an access point for the devices in our network, and the second one being used to redirect the traffic to the internet. The device we built in a way that is not complicated to get it going. So right after boot, the device is, is doing its operation. And we have a Python application that sniffs the DNS traffic and it's going to store in a local database the, the traffic. And the capture happens in real time. And for the use, the presentation of the data that we capture, we have a web application that doesn't, 
doesn't get the alarms, doesn't generate the alarms instantly, in real time. It consults periodic our database. So that generates a lag that it might take up to two minutes, which is the time delay that we capture, or which is the time delay that we generate alarms. It might take up to two minutes to, for an alarm to show up in our interface. And to finish up, we, we proved that our device is work, works as a simplified version of an intrusion detection system for IoT networks. And based on the information we get from these devices, we can determine whether the devices inside our network are trusted or not. So, and why that, is that information is important? Because, well, in future, future works, we can use that information to maintain connections or to uh, destroy connections inside our network. So there's no data going to devices that we don't know. And so, our, so far, our device only uses the DNS abnormal traffic capture to perform its analysis. But in the next, next versions of our device, we hope to perform analysis in the other data flows. And we, per, we want to perform a signature-based detection and a statistical anomaly detection. And we also want to include a timestamp because that's gonna give us a, a certain, a verification whether that packet is valid or not. And in future work, Oh, we want to make sure our device operates not only as a IDS, but also as a protection system inside our networks. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for that nice and concise presentation. Are there questions for the author? Yes, please. It's a very simple question. Like we implemented this in a device that you showed there. The question is, but nowadays, like uh, many functions are virtualized. The thing is that you do you really need to to have your own device, or you can do it uh, in a customer computer. Uh, well, or you server. Can, you can do it virtually, but in our case, we don't do it. Why? Because inside our network, that's only going to be one application that we build in our IoT gateway, which consists with a lot more. We, inside our network, we build a gateway, a device that handles all types of connection, not only internet-based protocols. So this what we present here, we hope that it's included in that gateway as just a functionality, a plus to it. So you have built this device. Is there any ambition to commercialize this, or why did you build it in the first place? Like well, we we first built it out of our necessity inside our laboratory. We have the many devices inside our laboratory capturing data from our environment, and we don't want persons that do not have physical access to our laboratory to know what's going on inside there, because that information might be might be sensitive to others. Like if we are transmitting for say the uh, electronics lock code to get in the door, we don't want anybody to capture that. So the answer is no. Yes, the answer is no. <laughs> okay, so if there are no further questions, then let us thank the speaker again. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for keeping the time so precisely and thank also all the participants for their questions and close this session. And now we have a coffee break. <laughs>